However, there's a lot of stuff that you're missing, uh, but uh, I will tell you this. Um, we wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor of it at home because uh, this is something that, that really deserves uh, more scrutiny and more people being aware of. If only, and I'm going to toss this out there, from the idea of media literacy. I got a little thing I'm going to say about that. But if for only that reason, and so if there's any educators at home, never mind if what you think you do is train in television or media or content creation or film or whatever, stop right now, stop what you're doing and pay attention because this is for you educators and people who are concerned about our democracy, about the future of uh, not just entertainment, but of, of communication and how we, how we interrelate with each other in an ever connected world and an ever um, easy to mislead the public world. So we're going to talk a, a little bit about that, but we're also going to talk about the fun part of it too, which is the content creation, monetization, and, and distribution of product and what that means in this world of, of, of what we call transmedia. So um, in, in just the way of a little bit of a, of a brief uh, introduction on that term, um, a lot of people uh, it means different things to, and that's good because it is so many different things. Um, but one of the, I guess, the characteristics or the hallmarks of when somebody's talking about transmedia uh, is the idea that uh, more and more your storytelling, your content creation is happening over multiple platforms. So that's, I think, one of the pretty much agreed upon hallmarks of what constitutes transmedia. That you're not just a filmmaker or a book writer or publisher or a uh, you know, television producer, but you're all of those things. And you're not just uh, creating content for an audience, and this is the other mind blower part, but you're not just creating a, 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 a linear kind of a communication where it's one to many or one to one, but they are a passive recipient, but that it is actually two two way flow of communication. Just like uh, we have in the back um, some folks that are actually on social media getting questions from folks to feed in, uh, and the way we're doing live in the room, so. So all of these things um, that used to be considered their own silos, uh, I'm a filmmaker, right? Well, 90% of the filmmakers I know, in fact, never even made a movie on film. So they're in fact not filmmakers at all. I mean, a film is a, is, a, is a term, but they're not creating film, and, they're, and it's not being shown in, in a, uh, a theatrical film format. In fact, for a lot of these filmmakers, this is the one and only time, the ones that are here in the, in the, in the festival, a lot of them, this is the only time that they're going to get any quote-unquote theatrical distribution. And for some of them, are you ready for this mind blower? They're not even thinking about trying to be in a theater per se. Some of them, that's not even a goal. And it doesn't have to be in order to uh, generate um, revenue. So those are ju just, just a couple of things that I'll throw out there. And if that confuses you more than then it enlightens you. Maybe uh, the panel here can help us shed some light on uh, on some of the details. So I would like to thank this wonderful panel and uh, and in the way of an introduction, uh, just have each one of them go briefly and introduce yourself and why you think I invited you to be <laughs> on this panel as it relates to this concept of transmedia. And then we'll get into some of these concepts and then hopefully uh, be able to entertain some of your questions. So I'm gonna start with my man Josh here from California Media Hello. Solutions. Yep, that's right. Josh from California Media Solutions. How's everybody doing today? Great. Awesome. So I'm not quite sure why Marty had me <laughs> out here. <laughs> and I'm asking myself that now, right now. So, but I do, I'm the IT guy, kind of, uh, camera expert. So if you guys have questions in that area, I can definitely help you guys. And not just cameras, too, but a lot of other kind of stuff, Absolutely, too. Absolutely. Yeah. What else? What else? Uh, everything A to Z broadcast. And a to Z broadcast. All right, very good. Like a and, you're, and, and you're California based. California based. I don't have to call New York. Nope. Never again. You're down in Benicia. I can't even go down yeah. to see you. Right? right. B yeah, B&H has to collect sales tax now, so. What? Yeah. Really? Oh, that, so there's no advantage? Right. Dude, keep your money at home, folks. You're going to pay New York sales taxes if you go through B&H. And uh, Mr. Gary Martin. 
so I'm the executive director at uh, Access Sacramento, uh, your local uh, community media station right here in Sacramento. Uh, this uh, uh, project is uh, going to be on our channels as well. Uh, so we thank uh, Marty for the opportunity to uh, create some content for the, the Sacramento County region, and we're also uh, streaming and uh, all of those types of things. Uh, when I think of transmedia, um, you know, Access Sacramento is a distributor, uh, which means that we have two cable channels, we have a radio station, uh, we have an internet stream, and uh, we have Facebook pages and Twitter accounts and Instagram. And as we talk about transmedia and uh, particularly cross-platform uh, distribution of information, uh, that's very much what, what we are all about. Uh, but I will tell you that um, as, uh, you know, uh, we think about this idea of transmedia also being an opportunity to have feedback, uh, that's where I'm going to be interested in hearing from uh, my partner over here at the uh, University of the Pacific on the panel, uh, because uh, I think he'll talk to you about the value of storytelling that involves the audience in a, in a, in a broader way as well. Uh, so my background with Access Sacramento, uh, formerly a college professor for 22 years uh, teaching radio, TV, and film, and before that, uh, 12 years in actual radio and TV as a commercial uh, reporter and uh, producer, um, ultimately uh, won an Emmy uh, for uh, television news uh, many, many, many years ago. So I'm uh, Kevin Pontuti. I'm a professor and director of University of the Pacific's Media X program, which is a interdisciplinary program aimed at uh, really kind of working around transmedia and creating content for multiple platforms, kind of one of our log lines. And, um, you know, I really think, uh, and I, I'm a filmmaker also, but I'm also a visual artist, and I come out of a really kind of a studio art background originally. So I like to think about transmedia as often when you have like an idea, but then are figuring out um, like where the best, how to best get it out there, or how to best communicate it. So a lot of us are trained as like, you know, a filmmaker or a painter. And, um, and I really like to, you know, there's a lot of artists and, and, and creators that are really looking at it from a, well, I've got this idea, but maybe it should be a book or maybe it should be um, a painting or maybe it should be a film and, or maybe both. You know, so thinking about how those things can kind of interweave um, and really kind of using the idea and the, the goal and the strategy to kind of get that across in the best way possible. Um, how many people in this room would uh, characterize yourself like if they uh, if you went to a, um, a networking group communicators and they asked you to get up and, and give your name and tell them what you do? would say more, th I do more than one thing. Like, I'm an actor, and a writer, and a producer, and a, how many people, show of hands? Okay, so you people are all transmedia, because you're wearing more than one hat, and you're doing multiple things, and so you guys are probably gonna get this um, probably a lot quicker than maybe uh, 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 another uh, group, like let's say the plumber's convention that I was um, <laughs> joking about down the hall here. They do it all too. They do, they do. Um, but I mean, let's can we can we just just in the way of, of kind of um, again a little bit more of a definition, um, Kevin, if you don't mind, maybe you could just expand on that a little bit in terms of um, the interdisciplinary approach. Maybe mm -hmm. if you maybe just tell us about your program a little bit in terms of what you're doing over there at Media X and why mm -hmm. um, you're doing it. I mean, what? So these graduates that graduate, mm -hmm. they're getting a multidisciplinary BA. education, yep. right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what are they doing when they graduate? Right. I know you. How long has the program been going on now? Uh, so we're just wrapping up the second year. So wow. I want to say it's already four years, but uh, well just it's been in, pl in the planning and the yeah. creation process for a long time. So, so yeah. So MediaX is a it's a new program and I think a new approach to thinking about um, you know both creative activities, but also. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a program, it's a very interdisciplinary. We're connecting um, students from across disciplines. So the goal of the program is to have students from like, you know, film, working with students in biology, with working with students um, in the music department. Uh, so it's a big kind of intersection of classes. And so a lot of it's based around kind of team projects or working you know, within groups, but getting students outside of their comfort zone mm -hmm. and, um, and, and really looking at kind of collaboration. Um, a lot of it really does have to do with storytelling. So a lot of the research is happening, 
happening in the you know kind of departments or the disciplines. But then um, the ideas of around kind of bringing you know pr the problem solving and the design thinking components um, really become like an interdisciplinary approach. And so when we think about, and we also kind of really look at it both from the creative standpoint, we, we basically have three pathways set up for students. They're all, I think, really kind of interconnected. So we have kind of a maker pathway, hmm. a manager pathway, and then a, um, an, an analyst pathway. And so I like to kind of explain how all three are kind of critical and important to any sort of endeavor. Um, but we know we have certain students that are going to kind of lean one way, you know, they might want to get more on the creative side, they might want to work more as kind of in the producing or the research side. Um, some of them might, might want to crunch numbers and think strategically about why we're doing this. Because all three of those pathways really are important and I look, you know, it's a very kind of holistic. Um, so we want them to, you know, the, the students to kind of develop this kind of holistic understanding of the um, creative, whether it's entertainment, whether it's um, creating these stories for you know social justice, for um, you know telling a story about themselves, even you know it's. But let, we let, want me, to let me ask you a quick very question. Very well rounded. Okay, and so but you say the number crunching. So I'm assuming you're, yeah. you're the more management um, aspect. Mm -hmm. um, why is it in in your opinion? Why is it important for that person? to have such an interdisciplinary background. If I'm gonna be a manager or I'm gonna mm -hmm. work on the business side, I'm gonna be a business type, producer type, why is it I important for me to have all that other uh, production, well, you know, content I, creation background? And maybe it's not a lot, maybe, it, you know, they're not gonna go necessarily as deep necessarily mm -hmm. as somebody who's specializing in, you know, the creative but side. But they're gonna get some. But they're gonna get some. And why? Um, because, it, it, it really helps them understand what the other people are doing. And it allows them to, you know, when you're working um, in teams, the more you can understand what your teammates, you know, at least a little bit about what their struggles are, what they're doing, what, um, you know, how hard some of it can be. It, it, it adds to like a respect of um, the, you know, the, I would call it the craft, but the, you know, the uh, endeavor. And so, um, you know, I think, and, and also, you know, you never know when you're going to have to flip sock or flip your mic for that matter. I like I like to talk with my hands a lot, um, but you never know. You never know when you're going to need to kind of flip. Are you roles Italian, or, Kevin? How'd you know? Um, so you Palm don't. You, so you don't know. You know. So the idea that in some cases the team may change, and you may need to get called in to do some things that maybe um, would be outside of your specialty, and, right. and, and feeling comfortable in that. And, and Marty, just sort yep. of adding to that yep. that idea of needing to have. Information Gary, Gary, I apologize. You drew the short. You drew the short mic, so you got to get a little closer. I apologize. Get closer, there. Um, you know the idea that uh, you know we, we run a film festival. We do a lot of television. Um, you know we're collecting performance releases for this this event. Uh, the idea that there are um, many aspects of uh, storytelling and creative storytelling that involve on the business side, not only uh, the content creation, but also the risk management. Uh, the idea that uh, if somebody on this panel suddenly didn't want themselves to be on television and you don't have a performance release, you have no way to protect yourself, your, your project suddenly is dead in the water because they're saying you can't put it on the air and you don't have permission from them to do so. Um, so there's a lot of risk management pieces. Um, when I stepped out of my comfort zone, unlike uh, what Marty's been doing for 20 years, six years ago when I suddenly was in charge of a film festival, uh, there was a pretty steep learning curve on making sure that um, the company was protected, that the filmmakers were protected, uh, that distribution was managed correctly. So there's a lot of pieces that you don't start thinking about until you've put on multiple hats. Yeah. And in this world of transmedia, it is, it is so critical that not only that you do great storytelling, but that you also protect yourself uh, within that distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really important. Mm -hmm. Well, Josh, now you're the actual business guy on, huh. the, uh, on the panel here in the sense of, you know, every day you, you, you get up in the morning and your, your job is to make your company, you know, profitable. And, and uh, you got some big um, competitors. So sp from that perspective, speak to me a little bit about um, when you're – you know, in business, and you're in a communications business, I assume you didn't have a degree in television production. Yeah. How did you get into this? Uh, my wife and I started the company. Get a little closer yeah, there. My wife and I started the company 23 years ago. 
Why? And we were what focusing on videotape. Yeah. That's what we sold. We came videotape, that was our, you know, big we sold we came to the Bay Area. Yeah. And a lot, we sold a lot of money year. in that, huh? Yeah. Actually <laughs> it's better business than our business now. Oh wow. <laughs> Let me say okay. that. So Back in the day it was a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We did like a million dollars our first year in sales, just selling videotape. Wow. But just really? there are a lot of beginning filmmakers right. here. And they would come to you with a question and say, Absolutely. how do I get started? What is that answer? Well, what are the pieces that I have to follow through on? Well, as far as starting a business, there's a ton of things to do. But yeah. first, you have to have a strategy, right? Yeah. What's your, how are you going to go to market? What are you, you going to focus on? You know, that's kind of like, how am I going to start? And, 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 and you had to course correct. Right. Because you, you're, doing, you're doing the bulk of your business was videotape. How do you analyze to, where, to know where to go from there? <laughs> or do, was it well, trial and error? Or no, about 10 years ago, we started selling uh, video equipment, maybe 15 years ago, because we knew videotape was going to be dying. So kind of like film is dying, is dead. People had to switch over to digital formats. That's right. So similar to that. And it, it, in that, what, what were some of the lessons that you learned about, about business that, I, that, that apply to, uh, you know, that you, these guys can take with them? Well, stay in constant contact with your customers and always try to find out what they're doing and how you can help them more, what, what you can do to serve them. That's a brilliant point because I'll tell you what, with, with um, what we learn and I think what Gary is talking about and what Kevin is talking about, uh, what, I, what I have found is, you know, we're thinking about it mostly because we're at the Sacramento Film Festival uh, as we're going to make a movie, right? And as I said at the top, it's not just a movie anymore, but nor is it just... I'm I'm in the business of just creating content that I am the sole imagineer of, right? Many of us might work for a company where we are the public information officer, right? Many of us may work uh, in an environment. That's kind of what I was getting to. I was going to try to get to with you, Kevin. Is I know you haven't been able to graduate that many folks, but what are some of the places that they that they end up at beside? Oh, I'm gonna make a movie. Well, definitely, um, we you know we have students that are um, even as they're in school still are working at you know nonprofits in Stockton that mm -hmm. are creating videos or doing social media storytelling. Um, you know, they're, they're they're everything from editing to you know to all all of that within um, kind of the video production realm. But we have um, uh, you know one st or, or students actually just got into AFI as a, into their grad program, which we were really excited about. But there's a lot of um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, especially now, um, you know, we always talk about the idea of being nimble and, uh, and having, you know, graduating, you know, students and, you know, even thinking ourselves about being nimble. Because mm -hmm. um, right now, like, we can kind of get a sense of, like, where things are at, barely. <laughs> um, but things are kind of, ch you know, they, they're changing faster and faster. And so um, we're really trying to kind of set students up to be able to kind of change gears, plug themselves in. in, in Manage in, Yeah, and kind of like, you know, kind of head towards their goals, but like, to, you know, be able to, you know, capitalize on the opportunities that they're given. And honestly, you know, a lot of opportunities exist um, within, you know, both bigger organizations, but then also lots of startups. And I think when you're in a smaller organization, like a startup, you're asked to often to wear multiple hats. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in that, um, in that moment of that, that sort of thing, you're really, you know, kind of drawing upon, you know, hopefully like a diverse kind of background of experiences, um, but also one that includes, um, you know, the, the kind of thinking that goes around, you know, strategic thinking or, or business, you know, type thinking, as well as the creative side. And if those get too disconnected, it can be really kind of problematic. So, um, and I, trust me, I make like art films, you know, or, you know, so I, I like to make things that are, you know, certain projects I make are very, like I don't care that they make money or not, but then other things like have to. <laughs> and uh, so, so there's like understanding, I think that a little bit that um, kind of factors into the, the ecosystem. In terms of Gary, in terms of uh, the wearing of multiple hats, um, talk to me a little bit if you would with your broadcast background about what perhaps maybe 20 or 30 years ago a broadcast uh, student uh, uh, might have had to um, know, like say a broadcast major, maybe somebody that was going to be an on-air talent, right? Mm -hmm. What they would have had to have known 20 years ago in order to get that job versus what they're going to be asked to do today. 
You know, I think the, the, the biggest difference as we talk about this idea of transmedia is how uh, critical it is uh, anymore to really be a jack of all trades. Um, you know, as I think about the news business, which is what I started out in, uh, there were in you know, the early days uh, the reporters and there were producers and writers and there were uh, anchors. Well, any more, you know, this idea of being simply a storyteller uh, is the critical part. Um, you know, Channel 10 uh, locally does not hire reporters anymore. Uh, they hire digital storytellers. And even uh, as many as 10 years ago, uh, the reporters that were creating uh, recorded news packages that would many times have aired on the five or the six o'clock news, if you talk with the reporters uh, now, they have many more reporter voiced packages that are exclusively on their website oh, yeah. than ever make it into the five or the six o'clock news. And, and, and you know, as you talk about technology, uh, you know, I'm, I'm old enough now and I have gray hair. I don't know if uh, Kevin has gray hair. Sometimes. Okay. He's, a, he's just, not going to tell. I would just say that, um, you know, when I started off in television news right out of college, I was shooting film. Mm -hmm. uh, we shot, you know, CP16, Cinema Product 16, Sound On Film, Film. Wow. And you had to edit film, you know, you had mm -hmm. to splice it in order to create uh, news packages for 5 o'clock, wow. yeah. So you know, when you were back at three o'clock, you had to process the film and edit it and have it on the air at five. The, the, the important part of that is that that type of technology has gone away. And now you need people like Josh who can tell you not only that you need a camera, but you also need to have a better microphone. And these are the types of microphones that will accomplish the task that you need to accomplish. Um, because digital storytelling uh, has really changed and continues to change remarkably quickly uh, even in the last couple of years. And at some point, Marty, in this discussion, I can tell you about a, a real transmedia project that we did a couple of years ago mm -hmm. that involved all of our distribution in one grand story. So at some point, we can come back sure, maybe to sure. that example. Well, uh, but um, I, I just want to say my dream has come true uh, because we've been joined here on the panel uh, by uh, Mr. Doug Stanley, who was, uh, if you missed it, was with us earlier today. We were talking mo mostly there about filmmaking, 21st century style filmmaking. Uh, however, today, this afternoon, right now, we're talking about this concept of transmedia. And um, Doug has been involved in so many projects over the years, uh, but uh, the one that you're probably going to most readily know uh, is that he's the producer of The Deadliest Catch, uh, which as a, a, a new kind of wave of what we now know to be reality TV caught a specific kind of uh, part of the zeitgeist, I, I guess you could say, where uh, now there are whole you know, scores of shows that are on television and uh, on the internet that, that explore the idea of the, the, the strange things that people do, not just for a living, but the strange things that people do. So, Doug, thank you for, for coming and uh, talking about uh, a, an Emmy Award-winning producer. I mean, th this show is on its 15th season. I don't know how many Emmys that, uh, that the show has won, but I know you've got a few. But if you would, what, what is, th we were just doing a little bit in the way of um, an introduction, but to you, what is, what is a transmedia project? What does that mean to you? It means I'm very interested in it because the fact is is that I've always tried to do things that, that move and move the needle one step further. And I have myself been involved with some big transmedia pro um, properties, which, you know, for example, we did uh, Dragonflies and Astronauts out of Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, please tell us what that is for those people who don't. Dragonflies and Astronauts was the largest rock opera since Tommy. And we did it with the, lar the best selling band in the history of Africa. Volkswagen sponsored it and uh, we ended up broadcasting live in 3D into 3D theaters across Africa and Europe. We took the same signal and took it into uh, DirecTV. They'd broadcast it on two channels in 3D and 2D and then we performed the first pay-per-view event in the history of Facebook with that signal. And it's those types of projects that have spent um, that have spent a lot of my time um, designing and trying to put together and trying to sell. And some of them have sold, and some of them have been, you know, 
is six months of uh, trying. Uh, and But uh, I'm very interested in, in all of the technologies and how they combine and what can be done in the future. You know, part of the problem with being on the bleeding edge of things is sometimes you're actually the one bleeding. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, some of the other projects I've attempted, uh, I wanted to do a five-month-long live broadcast off a ship as it crossed the Pacific Ocean filled with people from country, uh, from all over the world who were discussing current events. But the real reason we were there is because we were to be following a man swimming from Japan to San Francisco. So it was a big, it the big story was the ocean, the environment of the ocean, the North Pacific garbage patch, et cetera. And after, gosh, two years of trying to sell that to Pepsi and Coke and people like that, I finally had to turn away from it. The man did actually attempt the swim, and then he didn't make it. Um, he ended up, they ended up going, getting in a bunch of storms and heading that south of like Hawaii. A good show. But he had already <laughs> swam the Atlantic, so there was some level of credibility in it. But um, those types of projects have been things that I've very much been interested in, and I love, uh, for example, the technology going on in this room right now. Um, this, the technology combined with the Live U, which is allows cell phone broadcasting, or, or broadcasting through cell towers by segmenting the video signal into pieces, so it can be transmitted via several um, cell towers at the same time, and then reassembled on the far end into a full definition video signal, uh, I just, boy, I would love to use those all day, every day if I could. Well, we, can, we can talk. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we can arrange yeah. something. We can talk about that, too. I'll just, I'll just say that uh, our Friday night football uh, from all over Sacramento County, uh, you know, for 13 different broadcasts through the high school season is uh, broadcast from our big HD television truck to the station via Live View. Uh, the term is called bonded cellular, and for us, we take a high-definition signal and cut it up into seven different pieces, and it's send it through the cloud and bring it back down at the station, fully reassembled exactly two seconds later. Um, and it's possible because of this technology that America stole from the Israelis about seven years ago. I uh, thought the Israelis so still owned it. <laughs> but the important piece there is that you know one cell line carries only 1.6 megabits per second. And as we get into the weeds on that, that's kind of a small little internet stream to your Facebook. And that's okay, it looks great. But for us in broadcast, we need much more data. And so we put it on seven cell lines. So that the idea that there's technology that can help you with whatever your solution is, you know, start with what Kevin started. With. Your solution. You know, what is, what is your need? What are you trying to do? And then try and find the tools to make that happen. By the way, I just want to say it was Josh that I went through to get that technology that we're using today to get this to your cell phone and make it look good. So thank you, Josh. Thank Give you it up for Josh. Yep, yeah. Um, so you uh, just, you know, for me, just my mind just went boop <laughs> when you said what you said about the Dragonflies and Astronauts concert. Because when we're talking about transmedia, and now this actually gets into another aspect, which is the, it is the idea of, of monetization. Uh, in the earlier um, segment, you talked a little bit about it as it related to a couple of cable shows that you've been involved with. Um, and I want, I want you to kind of go back to that uh, for this audience, because it, it makes a perfect case in point as far as um, how as content creators we got to create content that's going to do what among other things that's going to sell that's going to that's going to you know allow us to continue to making content right hopefully and so in this brave new world where um, you hear guys like Mark Klebanoff earlier today saying hey you know it's harder and harder to make money making a movie right well what if your movie was really just um, a lost leader for something else. Uh, how many video game nuts do we have in here? Okay. You guys know about Call of Duty, right? <laughs> Call of Duty, right? <coughs> um, couple billion dollar gaming franchise. A year. Call of Duty itself 
makes a couple billion dollars a year. Now, I don't know how many movies, I think there's probably fewer than 20 movies in the history of cinema that have made a billion dollars at the box office. Okay, think about this for a second. There's maybe 20 movies that have made a billion dollars at the box office, yet every other year, Call of Duty releases a new edition that makes a couple of billion dollars. They're making a brand new Call of Duty movie, right? They're making a Call of Duty movie that is, at the end of the day, as far as they're concerned, just a commercial for the video game. Whether or not the movie makes a billion dollars at the box office, and it may, it may not, it's really just a commercial for the video game. So all that to ask you a question, Doug. Um, so in terms of monetization, um, talk to me a, b a little bit more about, y so you got uh, Dragonflies and Astronauts. That was, in, in terms of transmedia, that was multiple things. It was a live show, a pay-per-view event. What else? It was, it was a, you know, a live performance in Teatro Monte Cassino in Johannesburg. It was also uh, broadcast live into theaters across Africa and Europe. It was live on DirecTV in 3D, live on DirecTV in 2D, and, uh, you know, kind of a sideline because I owned the signal. I thought I'd throw a pay-per-view event on Facebook, and actually that's where my interest went for the next several years, you know. But uh, it wasn't what it was intended at first. It just kind of grew into that, and we kept seeing new opportunities and avenues. And, and you know, when you once you own the signal, if you own the content like we did, man, it was just like get it so out there. So talk to me about let me let me so with with that as kind of the prologue. Let me ask you this question. So you had uh, earlier today given us uh, an example of a couple of cable shows. Uh, Tell me what those shows were again, and then tell me what they thought the product was, and then tell me what products developed as a result. Just a little background on this. Um, what we were discussing earlier had to do with various m funding models. And in any kind of funding model, you're always looking for what is the motivation for somebody to provide you with the funding. And so in the earliest days of American Chopper, which was the show with the Tuttles on Discovery Channel, um, during the contract phase, uh, what, was ha what happened was uh, Discovery at that time had very little experience with the revenues that would come from not just branded products, but from the elevation of, of a brand that cr is created by the show itself. And they anticipated that the brand of American Chopper would be American Chopper, when in fact the brand that rose from American Chopper was OCC, Orange County Choppers. And the Tuttles held that rights to that exclusively. Uh, help me out. Uh, so, uh, so who was OCC and who were the Tuttles? The Tuttles were the, the father and son team that built custom choppers on American Chopper. And OCC was the name of their shop. And so people, you know, in order to be more organic or away from the TV show brand, they were more organic just as they were with Jesse James in Monster Garage, where the brand wasn't Monster Garage, it was West Coast Choppers, and we're still seeing that brand sold everywhere. And so these brands provided a lot of motivation over the course of time for other companies and other people to get involved in things because there was a model that had been created and the Tuttles had made you know 350 million or something like that in the first five years, I think, of just selling branded OCC products. And, uh, of course, their star rose and their business rose and everything rose behind it. But it became one of the motivations for getting things uh, funded. You know, for example, right now I'm doing a series where we're chasing real-time ships sinking and on fire and getting ready to explode and around the world. I've been doing that for two and a half years, just chasing real-time maritime incidents. And it is all about the raising of the brand of the company. And we got the company itself, rather than a TV network, rather than anybody, to lay down the funding that was necessary to create the series. They're, they had raised the Costa Concordia, if you guys remember the Italian cruise ship. And we went then with the concept of building a show around the family that owns this company and their exploits around the world. And uh, at first we were talking about creating a sizzle reel and just trying to sell it to the networks. But in the end, it, it turned it out that they just said, well, how much would a show like that cost? And I think we threw out a $7 million figure, and they said, oh, 
well, why don't we just do it ourselves? And so that's how it all began. And now it's, uh, you know, we're part way down the road. And I think we're it's maybe episode five of 19 that's scheduled. And yeah. I, I want to cycle back to something yeah. you said, though, uh, when you were talking about games and the, uh, the idea that there are multiple connectivities. Um, you know, I had a student who uh, left the community college, went and got the bachelor's degree, uh, went on and got her master's. But in the meantime, uh, her kind of between bachelor's and master's uh, job was as a writer for a video game. Uh, we like to talk about uh, those people who are behind the wheel and under the hood. Uh, the people who design the game and kind of its look so you can drive it and you... You know, and then you need the people who are under the hood that say when you take that controller and switch the switch to the right, something happens on the screen. So you have the programmers and you have the, the artists. Um, but you also need the writers. And what she did was write backstories for characters and uh, plot lines surrounding locations um, for these games. Because they had graphic artists who could make pictures of stuff going on. And they had under the hood programmers who could make switches, do things with stuff that happened on the screen to objects. But who cared until the writer came in and told the story? So part of it is you know, taking the skills that you have and turning them into skills that are profitable in what really is a transmedia world. Because you know that's where the jack of all trades kind of comes back. You know, you need to understand. You know, you have a skill set. Uh, you're developing more skills, and now you need to market that amongst yourself into a project that is successful. And it's likely that that'll continue to change and evolve. Also, like we're, yeah. we're, we're that idea of being nimble and continuing to evolve and looking for ways to kind of plug yourself into new situations. Um, and I think it's one of the most exciting things about it. It can also be the, one of the stressful things about it, but it's definitely, um, if you can kind of get into that mindset and embrace it, it's, it's, it could be a lot of fun. How many people are completely lost right now? You're just totally, <laughs> like, we're in over your head, and you, when, when you want to admit it, thank you, sir, you're a brave man, thank you. Because I know I am, I'm completely in over my head. But that's okay, because that's how you learn how to swim. They just, you know... You ever see those, those uh, videos of the Russian babies and they throw them in the deep end and it was back in the 70s? They just tossed them into the pool. You ever saw that? <laughs> I'm the only one that ever saw that? <laughs> yeah, there was this, that's how they trained their championship Russian swimmers. They took the little baby and they just chucked them into the pool. In America, that's called child abuse? It is. <laughs> in Russia, it's called how to train Olympic swimmers. Um, totally out of left field here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put Josh on the spot. Josh, what is the number one thing flying off the shelves for you right now? Number one thing, flying off the shelf. You can't keep it in stock. Yeah, AGCX 350s. What's that? It's a uh, 4K uh, Panasonic camcorder. It has hey. built-in NDI, which is the first camcorder that has NDI, which is a network protocol for new tech uh, switchers. Okay, talk to me about that because NDA. NDI. 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 It's a, it's um, like it's a, is a network protocol. It's a, yeah, broadcast. And it streaming. allows what? It allow, it's a streaming protocol for uh, that's an open source protocol that new, uh, new tech develop and license out to pretty much everybody and in the old days so bear with me here a little bit all you content creators that are not necessarily techies um, in the old days you have to have this coaxial cable right that would connect everything and that was kind of limited on on how the, the, the how far you could stretch it like you know you could get a coax from here to the back of the room there pretty good you probably depend on that signal or whatever. and But you had a limited number of inputs, and you had a limited number of things that you could do with those inputs, and a limited number of places that they could go. Right. What is NDI, by, by contrast, allowing you to do as a content so creator? Yeah, you can stream right to a, a new tech switcher, or stream right to, um, you know, you can plug in a Cat5 cable into your camera, and you can get it on the network and send your, your data feed to your, your switcher. And how far can you run that? Endless. Endless. Yeah. How many channels can you have? Um, thousands. Endless. It's endless. So what are the, what are the potential uses? Uh, right now, <laughs> broadcasting. This, Pretty this I, I would say endless. Uh, right. but yeah, but certainly broadcasters, but all kinds of other content creators, I would imagine. Well, because yeah. we, we, we think of broadcasters. So the, so the separation between community media producer... And broadcaster are 
you know, I mean, you see the same, you see broadcasters using the same gear that I see these these uh, community media. Right. Am I right, Gary? Well, well, exactly. I mean, I, you know, I know we're going to jump back uh, 20 years, but, uh, you know, think of the Persian Gulf War. Uh, you know, it used to be a news camera was a $40,000 device with a, you know, $15,000 lens with a $25,000 shoulder mounted recording system. You know, a $40,000 camera. And CNN's going, Persian Gulf War. I can't send a bunch of $40,000 uh, cameras into an environment where they could just get blown up. So suddenly they were operating with handy cams from Panasonic, which sold for at that time probably around $6,000. And that's what they did. You know, they were recording on $6,000 cameras and, a, and, a, and their reporter was there. Now they spent some money on little satellite hookups so that they could get the signal out. But even that now is, right, bonded cellular. You know, if the cell towers exist, you can, can broadcast from anywhere. So the technology really is, is changing and going much smaller, much cheaper, yeah. and much available. Yeah, and it's not just the acquisition. We, as filmmakers, we're like, oh, what did you shoot that on? Like every Q and A I do, the first question: What did you shoot that on? Um, you know, and filmmakers are now starting to like whatever I want. You know, it's, it's the tool. It's not the tool. It's the, it's the user. But but beyond that, it's not just what did you shoot that on, or or, or um, in the case of distribution of your content, it's not just what did you shoot that on, but how did you get it out to a public, to a community, to a group of users, to your your um, Facebook group, you know, the 500 friends that you got on your Facebook friend, friends group that now became 5,000 friends because you gave them content that they absolutely had to have as part of their lives. Uh, one of another transmedia project that somebody had brought up some time ago, and it was a film, it was a movie that they were making, but uh, the, re the reason I'm calling it a transmedia project is because they realized that what they had tapped into was a community. It was like this uh, community of, um, uh, I don't know what they call it, but it's go-kart racing. I don't know what the class of racing that is, but it was go-kart racing. Well, it comes to find out that there are, are you know, 300,000, 400,000 people around the United States that are nuts for this, just absolutely nuts for this. Now, if I'm going to NBC, CBS, ABC, and I go, hey, we're going to do go-kart racing on Wide World of Sports, right? And they go, uh, yeah, they look at it and they go, well, there's not enough money to make money off of that. There's not enough eyeballs to make money off that. For them, because they're a broadcaster, but if you're a narrowcaster, my cousin has a business called IP Narrowcast. Mm -hmm. If you have that Facebook group and all those people who love that, which maybe not as a huge group, but the people who are hugely into it are seeking it out and they can't find it anywhere, but you provide it to them, that could be very profitable for you. I, I see Kevin nodding his head. Yeah. Kevin, jump in. Well, I think you know when we're talking, whether it's from film or any sort of kind of creative project, is that idea of finding your audience. And that could be, like you said, either narrow. Um, things are scalable. Yeah, they're very scalable. And I think when you think, you, you know, a lot of time and a lot of, you know, I get back to that kind of research side of media X is like, you know, kind of we're, we're finding where these audiences existed or exist and finding how to, how to kind of connect with them and where they live. You know, there's a lot of research in terms of, um, you know, you may find, and, and how to talk to them, you know, and, and to build them and get them involved and excited about whatever project you're working on. And then I think once, you know, once you kind of figure out like who you're going after, um, you know, you know it, it's scalable in terms of audience, but also scalable in terms of production. Um, there's, you know, when you look at um, most productions, you know, they require like, you know, producing, you know, directing, maybe some sort of acting, editing, you know, and that could be one person. You know, there's a term that's going around now called, uh, it's, it's predator with the idea that your producer director, actor, and editor all in one. Um, You're you know, a predator. The predator, yeah. And, um, but, it, but it's also like you know that you, these are all kinds of components. And I, I'd argue that there's even more when you start getting into the distribution side. But that idea of like what are these key elements, um, sometimes that can literally happen with one person or a small team of three people or it could be scaled up to make an Avengers movie that is like 200,000 people probably working on that film. So, you know, there's that, you know, if you, that scalability. Yeah, it's not even necessarily a film. I, right, right, exactly. Or, or, then, or, then it's, or a it, piece of And I think when you think about that sort of video. mindset of this kind of, you know, whether it's Predator or just, you know, thinking like a producer would, 
um, and applying that to a variety of different mediums can really, you know, I think it, I think it helps kind of people think about like what they could do from a transmedia standpoint, whether that's from, you know, within marketing, you know, news, um, journalism, or, you know, entertainment, any of those things. Well, I want to give an example, but before I can do that, I have to ask uh, Jim Bailey if I can talk about the California State Fair. Um, so uh, one of our employees who's uh, here today uh, is uh, associated with uh, gaming and specifically uh, Twitch as an online uh, distribution service. Um, I think we can proudly say that uh, Jim uh, works less for us because he's making better money uh, by being in the top half percent of viewed game players and storytellers about games uh, on, on the internet. So, just, just, so for, Jim, just for, just tell us what Twitch is. What's uh, Twitch? T Twitch is a, um, um, an internet link up website that allows people to watch other people play video games and learn how to get through them. Is yeah. that a fair now, way I to just, describe I it? I just want to make sure we're clear on this. You're watching other people play video games. That's what's the, am I right? And you can chat alongside the game. And you can chat while so somebody else is playing a video <laughs> game. So, so when Jim plays, he's in the top half percent of people who are uh, watching uh, video game play in, in, this, in this network. The point being that in this niche market kind of connectivity, uh, Twitch is partnering with the California State Fair. I think it's fair to announce that. And they will be doing Wait, evening, are we getting a scoop here, Gary? Evening, uh, evening tournaments throughout the State Fair uh, where people will come together to play in a gigantic tournament. It will be broadcast on Twitch and they'll have reporters all over and doing a lot of live view connectivity. And, and all of that is very exciting because they have monetized their narrow cast, right? They've made a way to take their storytelling to put it in a distribution network that is gonna bring money to them. And that's a really powerful and fun thing in this world of media. And so congratulations to Jim, but also in make it, maybe making that come to the California State Fair in a 17 day run. So good for him. Good for you, Jim. Give it up for Jim, everybody. In the gladiatorial combat, <laughs> bum combat, he is a star. What's your what's your handle? What's your, what do they call you? Uh, Jamorian. Jamorian. <laughs> <laughs> Finish him. All right, um, all right. So, you know, you can see that transmedia projects can be profitable. What I want to do is, if we could, is just turn turn the page a little bit and talk about. Um, how they can be important. And I had mentioned up at the top about this idea of media literacy. And um, I have a growing concern uh, about what the Russians are going to do to us in 2020. <laughs> Which is, what time is it? Yeah. Um, and not just the Russians. And not just, and not just the Chinese. And not just the th but but um, the other day I was, I was on um, online and saw a story about uh, basically a technology that is now becoming available to the masses that in essence is the Photoshop of video. You know, you know what I'm talking about? It's, what they, it's the technology that they used in Forrest Gump to kind of make look like Forrest Gump was there, you know, dealing with JFK and everything and where JFK turns and he's like, so back in the day that used to be a rarefied thing that only a you know, few people in Hollywood could do. Now it's, some, it's becoming something that more and more people could do. Some people have theorized that, that the Ruskies or somebody else, some other bad actor, uh, some 400-pound uh, person sitting around in their, in, their, uh, in their underwear, as Trump likes to say, um, could, could take that and drop an October surprise on us that portrays some candidate, whoever might be presumably the Republican or Democratic nominee if they don't like them, drop that a couple days. My point being, my the, the overarching point being is that I think that um, we have to become educated as a public and as a community as to not only what we can do to make money with media, but also how we can um, help each other understand when we're being propagandized. And so does anybody beside me care about this <laughs> enough to want to speak to it, Kevin? So I mean, it's definitely something we talk about at school quite a bit. Where there's, you know, there's been such rapid development in tech 
um, and a lot of that around media over the last, you know, well, forever, but 10 years, say. And one of the things I think we're finding is that the, um, like the ethics research and the, you know, the understanding and the literacy side isn't always keeping up. And it's something that we really need to kind of work on. And I think it does come through education. It's anywhere near keeping it's, up. It's not yeah. near. And so, so, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, kind of creating a symposium around ethics and media. Um, that would be Count me in. okay good um, but something along those lines to really kind of focus um, you know this understanding about like okay well what's you know um, you know what's it I mean there's all sorts of things like what's it doing to your health what's it doing to like my students what's it doing you know all these rapid technological changes and, and a lot of it has to do with you know the phone and you know you know the amount of time people are on social media and how is that really affecting people and we just don't really know yet i mean there's we're starting to know and there's definitely people that know a little but i think there's a lot more there that we can mine there's so many examples of people that are that are ingesting information that they think is factual based information uh that as our president likes to call is in fact fake news uh and he ought to know one of the most historic <laughs> examples of that was uh, when you used to do uh, a google search right of surrounding martin luther king the number one website that used to come up, the number one website about Martin Luther King was written and authored by the KKK. So you can just imagine what the slant is on a particular website that com is coming up as the number one searchable hit. I don't believe that's the story, the case today. Uh, but at that time, early on, it was. And, and so you just have to wonder, you know, what is the slant that comes at you from news? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of criticism of major news networks. Not so much the ABCs, NBCs, and CBSs, but certainly the CNNs and the Fox News get a lot of criticism for not being fair and equal. And whose slogan is that? I just wonder, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, we're not going to come up with a lot of solutions, you know, right now, but, but just to throw it out there, I, I just wonder if, in fact, there could be um, some standards. You know, most industries have what they call best practices, right? If there could be some standards, there used to be a thing called the fairness doctrine that, um, that for broadcast media meant that if you were gonna take a, uh, uh, a, a position that is basically a, you know, an editorial type position, that that be clearly indicated as such and that you give somebody else equal time to, to take the uh, counterpoint. I would add, probably several more layers to that, uh, which would be a separation of editorial from news so that it is clear when you're looking at, like if you're looking at Sean Hannity, for example, that you're looking at an opinion piece program and not a news program. I don't think a lot of people understand that now. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if well, any of you have any suggestions along these lines about right. what kind of standards might be in place, but I think this is a conversation that they're having, they're starting to scratch the surface of on Capitol Hill right now around these Russia hearings, but I think that needs to happen. I'll jump in here on that. Yeah, thank um, you. You saved me. <laughs> you know, when it when it when it comes to to fairness doctrine, it's it's not equal time; it's equal opportunity. And in the 1980s, the law changed and became marketplace theory. So, in other words, it wasn't the challenge anymore for an individual station, either radio or television or cable, to find equal opportunity on its station. It became marketplace. If your station wanted to be all liberal, it was okay as long as in the marketplace there was all conservative thought available. So this idea of marketplace of ideas in this transmedia world puts the onus, as Marty points out, on all of us to be critical viewers of the things that we see. And unless we are digitally literate, comparing that information that's coming at us from the internet from radio, from television, from you know cable channels that are unfair, then we are not doing the job that we need to. Yeah, and, yeah. and I would challenge all of us and all of you that if you're not having these conversations with your children about being critical viewers of media, think all the way back to the days of Captain Kangaroo when they had to suddenly start putting fade to black and come to a commercial. Because when Captain Kangaroo and Mr. Green Jeans were talking about frosted flakes, sugary cereal, 
the television audience couldn't tell the difference. And so they had to and take a break the show ended and, where and the come into the show. Began. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, so that's a very important Critical point, viewers. Yeah. Critical um, education, critical to critical thinking. Um, so let me, have, let me open it up now to your questions. We've thrown a few things out there for you, and there's a lot uh, to kind of chew on, uh, none the least of which these kind of ethical questions about, uh, about the media and about uh, you know, when something's real or not. But, but also with respect to content creation, with respect to that your movie is not a movie, that your TV show is not a TV show, it's all of these things. We've touched a little bit on it, but w w let me hear what your questions are. Yes. You gotta you gotta make it quick because I gotta for translate for our TV audience. Uh, first, what advice do you have for storytellers in broadcast journalism, and what are the most common common mistakes that are avoidable? So, what what advice do you have for students of broadcast journalism and media, and how do you avoid? What are the pitfalls that you can avoid? That that's a very good question. I think um, I would uh, really I mean really kind of think and focus about two things. One is what's your story? Like what draws you to the story and is, you know, getting you, you know, making, what's the impetus for you feeling like you need to get it out in the world? And then number two is where is that for a broad audience or is that for more of a niche audience? And thinking about where that story is gonna go. I think if you can kind of get and focus on like the story side of it, um, and in, in what you're trying to do with that story, then a lot of the other things will kind of fall into place. Um, you'll figure out if it needs, you know, like how much of it goes on social media, who you're sending it out to, who you're trying to get to maybe, you know, to back it. Um, but like understanding what it is and what your goals are with it, I think is, is probably the biggest thing. And mistakes, um, not telling a good story. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah don't be boring. More about the, the mistake part, but. That's definitely from the starting point. Yeah, I, I, I would only add that uh, you know you have to ask questions. Uh, every story that comes out of at a reporter uh, begins with somebody who wants to share their story, and they have a point of view, and so you constantly have to ask yourself, you know, who would have a different point of view about this topic? Who would have an opposing view? Am I being fair to all sides of the people involved with the question? So ask questions would be my first uh, recommendation because after that, the distribution method is really just a matter of, uh, of what's available to you. You know, is it, is it the TV news? Is it radio news? Is it the internet? What is your distribution method and what is the mechanism for telling that story in the best way possible? Um, you know, as a TV producer, I hated anchors simply talking on camera. So if necessary, let's create a graphic and a list of, of, of important talking points because you can do that in five minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, find the way to visualize <coughs> it and tell that story. One thing, um, also if you're gonna be an investigative reporter or if you're gonna do anything other than just fluff, um, you know, is, is a lot of people that, well, I gotta get at both sides of the story. You gotta get at the truth, right? You gotta get at the truth. What is this thing? If you're an investigative reporter, um, what was that movie with uh, uh, Julia Roberts? What am I trying? What am I thinking of? Huh? So if you're trying to find out the story of Aaron Brockovich and whether or not that happened, you're not just going to get two sides of the story because one of those people are lying, right? So you got to get to the truth, and that's what I, one thing that I always tell broadcasters is that get to the truth. Don't you know, don't just represent. I mean, yeah, if you if there's a news story and somebody has a different shirt. But but if you're gonna be true to your audience, you got to be true to the truth. You got to get to the truth, and that that's harder, much harder to do. Because who knows? That's an in, that's a process. Yes, ma'am. How do you find for opportunities job. for jobs? Like, where would you go to, to find a, a job like that without taking the time to look for stuff? Well, 
Where do you where do you go to find right. jobs in new media? Yeah. I think well, Silicon I Valley, yeah. ma'am. So <laughs> 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 <Yeah, it's laughs> Doug, you want to talk about that? Yeah. Right. Well, I I think she had an interest. And so it starts with that. I, my advice as a college professor to my students was always essentially the same. Look at your circumstance and then look for the job. Mm -hmm. The circumstance is if you're trapped in Sacramento, then you have to find a job in Sacramento and what are the jobs that you wanted to have. And I will give you uh, the example of how I came back to California, which is where I was born and raised. I went to Reno, I went to Phoenix, and as we had kids and they were approaching school age, we knew that we did not want to have kids in school in Arizona. That was our choice. We wanted to come back to California. Where and it's so nice and cool in the, in the it's summer. It's wonderful, yeah, in right. Sacramento. So, so we, I looked at the area I wanted to go, and then I looked at the companies that I was willing to work for. Mm -hmm. And then I went to those companies and said, I'm coming to Sacramento. I'm going to work for a company like yours. You should hire me. So it starts with if, if their real interest is in a niche market, go find the people that have those jobs and ask what they need and then say, I can do that. Your kid but should be here too. But, but the, the <laughs> but How old is he? Yeah, you're right. No, <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. The, the important part of that is there are jobs in a variety of places. And don't be afraid to call the company you want to work for and say, how do I get a job with you? And, I, and I'd add to that too, it's like there's a lot of jobs popping up in places um, at companies or nonprofits that you wouldn't think would be hiring for that maybe thing. Um, we get a lot of calls from um, you know, local nonprofits where it's like, hey, we need somebody to do video editing. I'm like, well, you have, I mean, I didn't even know you would do that there, but because um, social media, their storytelling, and everybody needs a video these days. Um, there's lots of opportunities coming up in places that you wouldn't look. Um, that's not super that's helpful. So true. Um, it, it's helpful when you know it, but it's not helpful specifically. Um, there's also, we've been finding a lot of um, new media companies that are kind of uh, branding themselves as uh, under the term experience design. And so if you, um, you know, that's a, that's a place to look. And I have, I have a lot of students that are kind of doing research into those um, companies because they're popping up and they have, they really do take a transmedia approach to design. They think about it as, you know, even broader than media, but is in terms of experience. Um, and so that's a good place to kind of look. And we've been seeing a lot of job opportunities at, you know, at companies like that. This is not for 10 year olds, but, uh, but, but you, jo Josh, yeah. let me, Josh, let me ask you a quick question here. Yeah. Yep. Um, you don't have to give names, but I mean, who are the top clients that are purchin purchasing from you right now? Types. I mean, what, yeah. Where, what, yeah, types, types of clients. Uh, cinema customers, for sure, probably your top market. Government. So those are those like the individual Warm Springs Productions content creators are our biggest customer. Movie creators. Borrow Lenses. Okay. Yeah, companies like that. And then who else? Uh, uh, UC Berkeley, Stanford, so Yahoo. So higher learning institutions? Yahoo, yeah. Huh. Wells Fargo. So, uh, uh, Wells Fargo. That's interesting. <laughs> um, so there's the, the they're coming from they're coming from a lot of different uh, organizations and, and businesses that you might not think. And what we had something we had said earlier uh, in the earlier session is that um, I I personally know maybe ten guys that that make their living uh, doing advertising, uh, digital content for like the Chinese food place down the street. I mean, like if you get 10 of those clients, pay you $1,000 a month on a retainer, that's your yearly income right there. And that's highly doable at, at, at every level. Let me, uh, we got time for about one more question. Yes, right in the back, hi, give me a good one. No pressure. Doug, I think this is a question Taylor made for you. What, what, how do you protect your intellectual property in a digital age? Because I think we could, I think we could probably toss this one back and forth for a while. <laughs> I've kind of gone through cycles in my life on my digital protection and you know what I what I really want, because the fact is, what I really want is to get my art out there, 
And I, I've found, seen so many examples of people who are so stuck on this belongs to me and I made this and everything that they ruin incredible opportunities when in fact their object was to get their art out there and somebody else used it and spread it out to 100,000 people and they're like mad about it. I'm like, that's why I do this. You know, I'd like to make money too, but that person that spread it to 100,000 people wasn't making money. And so in the end, it really comes down to what what do you really want to do in the end? If you're if you're out to create a property that you need to secure in the long run as something that belongs to you and that's how you make your money, et cetera, I think part of that also is is how where are you at on the level? Where are you really trying to get? Because if you're really trying to get to the level to make real money, you need all that stuff tossed out everywhere. Yep. So the fact is, is uh, you know, for example, pitching projects. Boy, you talk about something difficult to do. I'm going to go in there and make these people sign all these documents not to reveal anything they've talked about, when in fact what I want them to do is tell everybody they know until they find something. And it's it's a, you know, it, there's a there's definitely a, a ne you know, it's it's a challenge. So in the old days, I just would go to great lengths to protect it, and I've ruined half the relationships just trying to get them to sign this stuff. And then in, in the end, I'm, I'm much more lenient and, and than anybody, maybe at this table or maybe anybody you know, because my real object in life is to get my works out there, and it's not to protect my stuff. And if somebody's making a, a whole bunch of money about on, on the my product, well, then I'll go after that person and go, hey, thanks for making all that money right now. You know, the thing is copyright because in an artistic work, according to the, you know, the copyright laws of the U.S., the moment you make it, you know, the moment a camera operator stops the red button from recording, that camera operator owns that. And, uh, it, you know, once you create an artistic work, if you can prove it's yours and you created it, you own it. I mean, and so in the end, it's really what do you want to do with this stuff, you know? Because my, my purpose is to, you know, propagate my art across the world if I can. Oh, I will only... Can I ask you a quick question? What, uh, what do you do? Um, well Give me one answer. Don't, don't tell me the whole... The whole what, what are you worried about right now? Um, what are you wanting to protect? Are you a writer? You want to protect a story around World War II history. Okay, good luck, first of all, with that. I, I, <laughs> Marty, I want to come back to something Doug said uh, because, you know, uh, he, was, he was talking about as a camera operator, as soon as you take that image, it, it's copywritten. I'm, I'm going to say that for people who come to work for us, they sign an agreement that's called work for hire, which means anything that they create for us belongs to us. Okay? Um, and so we are the owners uh, of all of that. But in fairness to that, that topic, I will tell you that as a free speech advocate, uh, at, you know, at a community access uh, center, it's all about getting your voice out there. We want your information out in the community. We want your voice to be heard. The things that you have to say are important to be heard, and that's what we do. So, um, so this idea of protecting your ownership uh, is kind of uh, the antithesis of what we're really all about. If you've created yeah, it, we want to help you share it. Right. And, and thank you, thank you, Gary, because um, this is actually a perfect point to end on. Um, by the way, what about this panel? You guys like this panel today? <laughs> All right. So, so um, uh, we're, we're you guys can, as long as these guys are willing to hang out, we'll, but at some point we've got to give the, the crew a break here. But, but this is a perfect point to end on because here's the thing. We all are trying to share, as Gary said, and as Doug, I think, so eloquently pointed out, uh, we're really trying to share our creativity. With respect to you writers out there who I think, and we're going to talk more about this tomorrow in the writing conference. You're going to come back for that, ma'am? Okay, good. Um, and a lot of people are worried about that. How do I protect my intellectual property? I'm going to tell you a real quick anecdote that, was, um, that, I, that I witnessed firsthand, but it involved two people. One, uh, a lady who was a very famous writer here in Sacramento, who transitioned over into screenwriting through a contact she made through the Sacramento Film Festival. I'm not going to name any names. The other gentleman, though, uh, is now a major motion picture director and producer who has a movie that literally dropped today. 
okay? And he's, from, he's also from Sacramento. But he had a movie that just dropped in 3,000 theaters today that stars Randy Quaid and uh, Megan Good. What's the name of it? Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid. I'm sorry. I said Randy Quaid. Dennis Quaid. I get them two Quaid brothers mixed up because they're so, they look so much alike, the two of those Quaid brothers. No, Dennis Quaid. I'm sorry. And uh, Megan Good. And uh, what's the name of this movie? Anybody? Help me out. It's dropping today in 3,000 theaters. The Intruder. Okay. So this, this, this lady, it was her first screenplay that she'd ever written that actually got picked up. And to your point, it was uh, an urban comedy. Lovely lady, white lady, probably not hanging out in the types of venues where uh, a lot of urban comedy is happening, but she wrote a good story, okay? The movie she had not seen, it was world premiered at, at, at uh, the 24th Street Theater, uh, and we brought uh, 300 kids from, um, from Oak Park to see it for free, uh, only to realize it was R-rated, and I probably shouldn't have done that, but oh well. <laughs> <laughs> That was a big piece of the comedy right there. <laughs> um, it was a who's who of uh, African-American comedians was in this. Al Shearer was in it. Uh, Charlie Murphy was in this movie. Um, David Allen Greer from uh, so many shows uh, 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 was in it. Um, in Living Color, so many other shows he's been in. Just a who's who of black comics was in this movie. But the script in its initial form was written by this lovely little very white suburban lady, okay? So we're getting ready for the after party and I'm in the, the green room there getting everything ready and she bursts into the room and with tears, projectile tears coming out of her eyes and said, I can't believe it, what they've done. I'm like what? I, I thought somebody had died. I'm like what, 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 what they did here? Have a, have a fun. They changed my words. What? <laughs> what are you talking about? They changed my words. They said that's not what I wrote. And I'm like, what you wrote? What do you? What do you <laughs> did you really think for one second that those words from that lovely, lovely, very white <laughs> suburban housewife were going to come out of Charlie Murphy's mouth? It's not going to happen. So my point to you is this, is that in the creative process, we are all sharing. It is all one big exercise in transmedia because if it doesn't transfer from my perception to yours and, it, and there isn't some exchange in that, um, it's probably not going to find an audience. It's not going to resonate with anybody. And hopefully, if there's anything that we take from the, from the, from the panel today, is that we're all in it together and we're all learning from each other and we're all taking from each other. And yeah, you're going to get stolen from and sometimes you might have to go after them. But there are other times where um, the, the sharing is going to benefit you at the end of the day. Because at the end of the day, her name was still on there as screenwriter. Even if Charlie Murphy made half the jokes, she was still the credited screenwriter. She still gets to go make another movie with that under her belt. And with that said, can we do a huge round of applause for this amazing panel? Mr. <laughs> Douglas Stanley, Josh from California Media Solutions, you're going to be in back of the room. My man, Gary Martin from Access Sacramento, and Kevin Pontuti, Media X, Ask for It Bay Name. We got parties tonight. We got movies tonight. We got a whole conference tomorrow. We want to see you then. Until then, we want to thank all of our TV audience. And we're going to be back here, TV folks, tomorrow at 10 a.m., with the American Screenwriters Conference. Thank you and good night. For those actors, there's a cast and crew call flyer on the JVC table back there. Uh, we have our big uh, place called Sacramento uh, Volunteer Actor uh, Instant Audition Wednesday at 6 o'clock here in Sacramento. If you have actors uh, of any age and any description, uh, we're looking for volunteers. Uh, we're going to announce the 10 10 minute films that we're going to be making uh, this summer. And uh, you can get your first big screen credit and IMDb credit for being a part of those. Come to our cast and crew call. There's a flyer on the JVC table. Thank you. One more thing to everybody, too. If you desire to make media, get out there and make media. Chase your passions as far as you can because things happen that are magical along the way. So rather than thinking about it, get out and get engaged and get 
get involved in it because my grandfather once told me, look for things unlooked for along the way. 